it, it, it's something that never leaves you. And uh, that just the, the shock, you know, we were all so unprepared. I thought I was going to do something completely different that day about mm. my grandmother. And uh, uh, it, 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 it's, um, yeah, it, I mean, it, it's been one of the most momentous experiences of my life, really. Today is, of course, September 11th. Um, around it comes again, another anniversary. Oh, yes. Well, it, it's something, it's unbelievable to me that it happened 22 years ago because um, I was there, you know. When? And uh, yeah, I was there for the Sunday Times. I was New York correspondent. And I just happened to be at Battery Park on the morning of um, 9-11. Didn't know it was a significant date then. Not because I was doing something for the Sunday Times. It was a Tuesday morning, as I recall. But because I was meeting a friend from the BBC to record a program about Ellis Island, which my American grandmother had passed through in the early 1900s. And we were going to look up her records for the first time. So there we were in the, you know, very early uh, on that bright day, um, just, um, you know, waiting. We were going to go and catch the ferry to Ellis Island. Um, and I hadn't actually met up with my BBC friend at the time. You know, I was sort of heading towards her when I heard this massive bang. And that turned out to be not the first plane, but actually the second plane hitting the tower. I just emerged from the subway. So, of course, I ran to have a look what was going on. You couldn't see at first because, you know, skyscrapers can weirdly, even as tall a building as um, the World Trade Center, they can block each other out. And then I turned the corner and I saw these two buildings with giant gashes in them only a couple of blocks away. It was absolutely terrifying. What did you think in that moment? Oh, you know, I was absolutely shell shocked. I mean, I could, you could, you could see bodies strewn around as well, and that that was from the planes which had sort of blown out. Nobody ever really talks about all that. It's really sad. So it was absolutely horrifying. But I tell you what, I didn't know what to make of it initially, and um, and then actually, I was on the phone to the Sunday Times trying to tell them that I'm I'm there. Don't worry, you know. I, no need to try and raise me in in Brooklyn at my home in Brooklyn. So, and um, I got through to the deputy foreign editor Peter Conradi. Um, he was still with the Sunday Times, and uh, then he suddenly told me that a third plane had just hit the Pentagon. And at that point, I thought maybe we're in World War Three. Um, you know, you couldn't tell at the time that it was more serious what was going on in New York than at the Pentagon. But I thought maybe a massive attack on America was underway, uh, which it was actually, but not quite, you know, what I was really scared of. And of course, the horrific scenes unfolded. And, um, you know, I had to I had to run for my life when the first tower came down. You had to run for your life. Yeah. I mean, the building was was falling and um you know I was caught in this terrible dust storm and I had no idea you know I had no idea the building's so tall I mean they dominated the skyline in New York and uh I was I was so shocked when there was this loud rumbling and cascading of masonry I thought god is this the way you know life ends um, but I wasn't watching it on television and therefore I couldn't tell that the buildings were more or less, well, the first building at this stage was going straight down and the second one fell in the same way, sort of more or less collapsed on itself. So although there was a massive dust storm that uh, that sort of obviously filled the surrounding streets, the whole of Lower Manhattan, uh, it wasn't quite as I expected, which was to be caught by sort of toppling masonry from the 101 floors. Um, because at that point, you, you know, you thought anywhere up to the river would just be flattened. So, um, you know, mercifully, they did sort of fall down on themselves. But of course, that day, um, you know, nearly 3000 people died in a stroke. And I think I think Americans and the rest of the world and certainly British people as well, just forget how traumatic it was for for everybody in America. America's not used to being attacked and for nearly 3000 people to lose their lives out of the blue in one morning was just uh, unbelievable. Mm. And you mentioned it there, but the one thing there was, it was a 20th anniversary, wasn't it? A few weeks back. Uh, sorry, a few, few years back, sorry. 
and yeah, um, and the, and there was the um, there was a slew of documentaries about it, and one of the probably one of the best television documentaries I've ever watched actually uh, was nine eleven inside the president's war room, and it was one of very few media outlets to get hold of Bush and to have Bush on the record for the twentieth anniversary. Didn't do very mm-hmm. much or anything sort of speech and you know a moment to sort of commemorate but in terms of sort of sitting down with the documentary crew this was incredibly rare and yes they spoke to Consley's Rice and Dick Cheney you know various sort of people people who were in and around um that press you know who, who were there who were in the president's war room basically did what it said on the tin and one of the things that really came across was just that panic and that uncertainty that even the president of the United States of America and those closest to him just had absolutely no idea what was going on and really, really no idea how to properly, ha- you know, Bush's, Bush's handling of, of the aftermath of that was, you know, very heavily criticised and, you know, m- maybe fairly in, in some quarters, unfairly in others. But one thing that I will tell you is that watching that documentary just gave you a sense of how immensely difficult whoever was at the top that day had it. Well, you're right about that, Daryl, because um, in hindsight, of course, it's easy to mock that, you know, George Bush was caught reading My Pet Goat to uh, some school children and, and carried on finishing the story. But um, and of course, in hindsight, one can connect various dots, signs that were missed, you know, cooperation between intelligence agencies that didn't happen. You know, the fact that there were people training to um to fly at various flight schools across the US, but somehow didn't bother to learn to land, you know, these kind of clues. But at the time, no one envisaged um, quite such a drama. And there's no question that the US government was caught on the hop. George Bush was shell-shocked. Dick Cheney, um, the vice president, was was, um, in the White House and uh, took charge while Bush was being flown, you know, to a secure location, et cetera. I mean, there... At that point, you end up getting being very much in the hands of your secret servicemen. Uh, you know, something similar was like unfolding with Mike Pence to some extent on um, January 6th at the US Capitol when the secret servicemen wanted to whisk him away from the scene. And actually, Mike Pence refused. Um, so but you just it was I think people have forgotten just what a stunning uh, surprise attack it was and how um, we were all in a fog of war. I mean, I ended up um, trying to evacuate, obviously, you know, worrying about the second tower coming down and landing on me, you know, once I realised the first wasn't going to. And, uh, uh, you know, you'd hear these sonic booms across the air in New York, which which were actually fighter jets scrambling, but it felt like there were more bombs going off. So everybody was in a state of near panic. And it was very hard to know what, what was going on and um, I mean I certainly uh, remember I mean I I remember silly things like my children lived across the Brooklyn Bridge you know I mean that's where my house was just over the over the bridge in Brooklyn Heights and I felt desperate to get back to them and give them a hug and make sure they were safe and then of course once I did get back and I was covered in ash and I had a shower and then of course I thought oh my god I'm on the wrong side of the bridge now and I had to you know like I'm a reporter I had to spend time trying to get back in by then it was sort of lockdown I did manage but you know mm, that was, no. you know you, you, all sorts of crazy thoughts are going through your head at the time and um anyway yeah you mentioned you mentioned the 20th um anniversary well it was that was two years ago Gosh, time goes fast. And I finally psyched myself up to go to the 9-11 Memorial Museum, um, which is at Ground Zero, which is an interesting uh, museum, but I never particularly wanted to visit it because I didn't want to sort of relive the horror of that day. But I thought 20 years on, I'm going to go and have a look. Anyway, I'm wandering around there and um, and I suddenly do a double take and think, oh, somebody looks like me in a picture there. And I suddenly go, oh, that is me. And um, wow. yeah, so there's a picture of me standing near the ruins of the, uh, it's actually taken the um, morning after when I also tried to wangle my way into Ground Zero. And I'm there in silhouette. Anyway, it was all, it was, I was pretty amazed actually. Goodness You're one me. of the people to know this, Daryl. Yeah, wow, that's extraordinary. Blimey, goodness me. A difficult experience for you then going to that museum. Yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't say um, 
that I suffered post-traumatic stress. Like a lot of um, like a lot of journalists, you sort of just get on with the work, really, and you're interviewing survivors who have really suffered. You know, everybody in in Manhattan was offered, you know, free counselling and God knows what. And of course, as a journalist, you kind of work through it all by going around um, interviewing people about their experiences. And I, I remember crying terribly as I was writing a piece about children who were bereaved, you know, lost a parent. And um, because you don't have time to think about your own reaction, you're too busy. And it is it is cathartic working through it. But but later you do feel disturbed. And I felt very disturbed on the first anniversary, you know, really quite tearful all over again. And it, it it's something that never leaves you. And uh, the, just the, the shock, you know, we were all so unprepared. I thought I was going to do something completely different that day about mm. my grandmother. And uh, uh, it, 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 it's, um, yeah, it, I mean, it, it's been one of the most momentous experiences of my life, really. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. I talk about this a lot, but I was, I was on the scene of the uh, Manchester Arena bomb live my oh wow terrible yeah yeah my flat was just next door heard the bomb and went down and saw people struggling with shrapnel wounds and you know did what you did we did what you did which is just snap into journalist mode don't you and i went on air and we did a show from we did a show through the night and you know all that days and days and days of kind of appeared on television and you know all that kind of kind of stuff which just all sort of kicks in and then a couple of months later uh, or maybe even maybe even less maybe five six weeks um, I uh, there was I was walking home one night through 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 the city and not far actually from from the arena going back to my flat and there were some lads who were um, play who were who were playing on their um, skateboards and they knocked a sign over it's one of those sort of metal signs road signs mm-hmm. and it made this almighty bang this noise and I really snapped at them. I really snapped at them. You know, I tore them apart. I tore them <laughs> apart. And they were sort I get of, it. they were kind of really shocked. They were like, what? Are, like, dude, you know, calm down. What's, what's wrong with you? And walking away from that, I thought, what have I just done there? What, what, where did that come from? What on earth was that about? And that was the moment I realized that actually there was a lot going on that I hadn't processed and that I hadn't dealt with. And, you know, and, and that clear, you know, there's fairly obvious loud noise trigger there, isn't there, going on. But it's, it, just, it just creeps up on you, doesn't it? Afterwards. <laughs> That Manchester arena bombing was so traumatic because it involved children who were going to enjoy a concert by Ariadna Grande. I mean, it wasn't, you know, I mean, mercifully, people worried a lot about um, children, you know, in the shadow of the World Trade Center. There was a sort of nursery and a school nearby, et cetera, but, but the children were unhurt. Obviously, a lot of children, I mean, you know, thousands lost a parent that day. But... Um, they weren't themselves killed. I mean, it must have been so traumatic to see those scenes mm. in Manchester. And, you know, I, I'm one of those people who's very shocked by the behaviour of the emergency services that deliberately held back. Yeah. Um, thinking there might still be an active terrorist on the scene instead of rushing in as they should have done to protect people and help evacuate the wounded. Mm. In fact, one, one of the real lessons there was about communication, wasn't it? And about... about you know, people just not the, the fog of the fog of of war. Really, you know, and I, I remember on the night speaking to my um, bosses at the radio station that I was working at at the time and saying something really serious has happened here. We need to, we need you need to come to me. We need to do something about this. Um, and and they were saying, oh, I've I've heard that I've heard that it's a speaker that's blown. And you know, so I said, no, I'm I'm stood here. I'm watching this unfold. You know, you can you can trust me about this. But people just not knowing, and actually the people that I was speaking to on the scene not really knowing what what had gone on. And that was very present, and obviously, obviously present in in nine eleven. But um, it, it, you, you kind of until you, until you're sort of in it, it's very difficult to get a sense of of the of the utter chaos of a moment like that. It's just absolute carnage, isn't it? I tell you what, Daryl, I I've really changed my view about authorities on that day because they don't know what's happening either, hmm. and um, in. In my view, and this is advice I've given my children, and you can disagree with it if you want. Not all listeners will agree. I actually wrote a column about this for the Sunday Times. I, I, I'm like, do not follow advice to stay put. 
This happened at Grenfell. There was advice given to stay put in the second tower of the um, World Trade Center, you know, on the grounds that they were evacuating the first tower that was hit, so stay put. But of course, the second tower was then hit and people got killed who could have been evacuated. The authorities always want to bring a sense of calm if they can. They tell people don't, you know, to proceed in. You know, I, I'm like, follow your instinct. If it looks bad, and your and your instinct is to get out. Obviously, don't trample anybody in the rush. Don't don't do anything foolish. But follow, obey your own instinct because authorities don't know any better than you do. Quite often in the fog of war, mm. and that you have to obey your own instinct in these matters because quite often the initial advice is wrong. Yeah, everybody will have an opinion on that, won't they? But I don't. I don't. I don't think that's a controversial thing to say, actually. Um, I don't at all. Well, I got I got criticised by firefighter unions. Yeah, involved I'm sure. I'm sure. And God yeah. knows what. Because I was like, no, this is bad advice. Yeah, naturally, naturally, naturally. People There's... were waiting at Grenfell for the firefighters to come, as mm. promised. They'd have been much better to just get out. Mm, yeah. The first smell of smoke. Yeah, so, tricky, tricky one. Anyway, tricky I'm standing one. by my view, but you'd be surprised what a pushback I got. Yeah, no, I'm not surprised actually. I mean, it is, it is, it's a, it's a, it's a. It's a Touchy subject, isn't it? And people, yeah, people have strong views on that for sure. Um, just kind of, what just, what just, just, in fact, I've got two final points to make about this. The firstly, firstly, is the speed of communication. How, how, and sort of leading, I guess, to, to, to what, um, to what we were just talking about. I suppose, I suppose 9 11, in contrast to the Manchester Arena bomb, the speed of communication was relatively speaking quite slow. Getting, communi- getting especially getting information to George Bush, who was on Air Force One occasionally getting a bit of TV signal as he flew over towns, you know, where he could where he could get connected to a mast. Um, that was extraordinary detail, wasn't it, that he was sort of just getting patchy information. Um, and presumably you also dispatching your pieces to the Times and, and, and trying to find out what's going on. But also the, 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 the rapid information that was flying around the Manchester Arena bomb also act equally as unhelpful because it was... Uh, there, I mean, there were all sorts of stories about good men on the loose at children's hospitals and, you know, things like that, and a, a second attack in a, a different part of Manchester. All of them came to nothing. But two very different eras there, both with their own communication problem. Yeah, well, what happened in New York is that, of course, everybody in the world there, you know, millions of people were trying to ring their families and God knows what. And, of course, the, the communication network just simply wasn't up to it. And uh, so it became very hard. I did actually manage, I found uh, some sort of payphone in a restaurant, which I managed to connect to the Sunday Times. My cell phone was not working. Um, But then, of course, it was just as I was hearing about the Pentagon being hit that we got cut off. So at that point, I thought maybe Washington had been nuked. You know, you don't know what the hell's going on. Mm. Yeah, yeah, wow. And, And the final point to make on this, links us back you you talking earlier about um january 6th and all that sort of stuff and rudy giuliani of course who was present in the january 6th uh situation but was was mayor was he mayor of new york at the time or shortly after i think it was the time wasn't he and it that was, was at the time yeah. he was a brilliant mayor of new york at the time he really led the um led New Yorkers through that crisis with a sense of calm and dignity. And I can remember very clearly him talking to New Yorkers and saying, we don't know the casualty figures yet, but it will be more than we can bear, which I thought was an incredibly graceful way of addressing the scale of the problem. And I'm so sorry to see him as he is now, making a complete ass of himself and, uh, lying about stolen elections, uh, frequently accused even by um, Trump's own inner circle of being drunk and uh, behaving disgracefully uh, to his own employees. We've heard a tape of him, you know, calling one of his own employees big tits and and she's now suing him for sexual harassment. What a sad decline. Yeah, it is extraordinary contrast, isn't it, that, between those two? Those two people feel like totally different people, don't they? The really Giuliani yeah. there of, of them. Um, I think been... he found it hard to fade from view after 9-11. He was, you know, hailed as the man of the hour. He he actually got a knighthood from the Queen, so he's Sir Rudy Giuliani, but if you're a foreigner, you don't use it. 
And um, he was hailed on, um, as America's mayor that day. He then ran for president and was not a successful contender for president. He didn't sort of translate well onto the big stage. And I think he he kind of, I, I think he found it hard not to not to matter anymore. And I think that's why he was so determined to join forces with Trump and be relevant again. And it's led him on the road to ruin. He now faces giant legal bills. Of course, all the accusations against him, I should say, are alleged. But um, we all saw him making a ludicrous um, press conference at the Four Seasons with hair dye running down his face. He has made himself a ludicrous figure, and it's extremely sad. I was a huge admirer of him on of him on nine eleven. And you know what? It's a story that will always, um, always, always stir feeling, won't it? I mean, you know, it's it's impossible to to not think of that period, whoever you are, wherever you were, whether you were close to it like you were, Sarah, or whether you were several thousand. Uh, so well, at least a couple of thousand miles away and it nine years old beginning. i think it was at the time as well oh you were very young it marked the um beginning of a very uncertain century i think the 1990s have been a period of great optimism um and uh you know with peace agreements in places like northern ireland almost in israel though never quite um, you know, and the the collapse of the Soviet Union meant that there was a new hope for Eastern Europe. And 2001, the 9-11 attacks meant a very rude awakening for the 20th century, a 21st century. And we've gone on to see the war in Ukraine and other fallout. It hasn't been an easy time. Mm. You know, the wars in Iraq, Afghanistan. It's been a difficult era.